Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Anika Min, and I'm a program associate for ecosystem-based adaptation at IUCN. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this session on climate justice for people and nature um, through urban ecosystem-based adaptation, a focus on the global south. This event is organized by the Friends of EBA and Plan Adapt, who co-chair the FIBA Working Group on Urban EBA. In an increasingly urbanized world and the context of a changing climate, ecosystems can greatly improve the livability of our cities. Ecosystem-based adaptation, or EBA, encompasses approaches to conserve, restore, and sustainably manage ecosystems and their services in order to reduce vulnerability to climate change. EBA also generates co-benefits, such as food and water security, job creation, and greater community cohesion and empowerment. Ecosystems and their services can also deliver climate just outcomes, particularly in urban areas of the global south. In August 2021, the FIBA Urban EBA Working Group published the joint technical paper, Climate Justice for People and Nature Through Urban Ecosystem-Based Adaptation, a focus on the global south. The paper gathers practical examples of urban EBA interventions and explores their links with seven EBA social principles related to climate justice. During this webinar, we will learn more about the seven EBA social principles, explore their relationship to existing standards for EBA and nature-based solutions, learn from practitioners how EBA interventions on the ground are working toward climate justice, and discuss next steps for contributing to climate justice through EBA. We will begin the 90-minute session with opening remarks and a quick audience check-in on Mentimeter. This will be followed by a keynote speaker and a paper presentation, which will lead into a panel discussion about on-the-ground implementation of the EBA social principles. Finally, we will conclude with closing remarks. Please note that the session is being recorded and will be available on the FIBA YouTube channel afterward. We welcome your questions for the panelists. Please submit them via the Q&A function. We will also have interactive Mentimeter questions throughout. So once you pull up the website or app, please keep it open for the rest of the session. We recommend that you access Mentimeter using a separate device if possible, such as your mobile phone, so that you can continue to view the webinar uninterrupted during the interactive portions of the session. Um, we will put the Mentimeter link in the chat, um, but you can also see it on your screen here in case you want to get it open ready. To kick off the session, I'll be facilitating a short check-in with our audience using Mentimeter. Um, to join, please use this link, um, or I will put it in the chat as well. Actually, Wendy, could you put it in the chat? That'd be great. Um, we'd like for you to join us on Mentimeter for a few minutes so we can get a better understanding of who is joining the session. I will switch to sharing the Mentimeter screen now. All right, so to join us, you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 6804. Six nine one seven. I'll give everyone a couple moments to get it up and ready. Okay, I see people are starting to join us in Mentimeter. Just wait another moment. Okay, great, people are joining us. Um, so for our first question today, what city are you joining us from? Of course, this, is, um, this webinar has a focus on urban areas, so we'd like to know where you are. If you're not in the city, that's fine too. Just let us know. Okay, great, Bonn, Washington, Clayton, Neva. I know that this event spans quite a range of time zones, so thank you for joining us, whether it's early morning for you or late at night or afternoon or somewhere in between. Okay, great, we have quite a spread. Um, so for our next question is, um, it is how familiar are you with ecosystem-based adaptation? So this is, um, you can use the slider on the Mentimeter website or app. Um, to indicate from on a sliding scale of zero to 10 for experts. Um, so we know that people who are joining this webinar may have varying degrees of familiarity with ecosystem-based adaptation or nature-based solutions. Um, it does look like we have quite a few experts um, joining us today. Um, so thank you, regardless of um, how familiar you are with EBA. And thank you for joining us to explore how ecosystem-based adaptation can help contribute to climate justice on the ground. 
Okay, great. Thank you for participating in our first round of Mentimeter questions. Um, we will be asking a few more, so keep this open if you can. Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce Jesse Jamari Kinney uh, for the opening remarks. Jesse is a senior expert on climate change adaptation, nature-based solutions, and research for impact at PlanAdapt. Jesse, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Annika. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Uh, and of course, happy Urban October. Um, welcome, and thank you for your participation in the Mentimeter. Uh, it looks like we have a bit of a Northern focus from what we've just seen in the, at first glance, and a pretty good level of familiarity of uh, EBA, which is, which is great to hear. So we can hopefully learn from each other and, and share our experiences here today. Um, as you've heard, my name is Jesse DeMaria Kinney with Plan Adapt, and I'd like to start today's conversation with a background on the Friends of Ecosystem Based Adaptation Urban EBA Working Group and where our work and this webinar has emerged from. Um, but before that, just remind ourselves that we're nearing the end of this year's Urban October, which has the theme of Better City, Better Life, and with a specific uh, theme of adapting cities for climate resilience. So it's great to see adaptation continue to move up on the priorities list, um, particularly in cities. We know that cities worldwide have are, are, are already feeling the effects of, of climate related impacts, floods and droughts, heat waves, storms, landslides, even sea level rise and increase in coastal flooding is already being experienced. Um, the working group one on the physical science of the sixth assessment report or AR6 which was released in August, um, provided the most up-to-date uh, physical understanding of the climate system and climate change, and clearly stated, yet again, that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, so while we're waiting for the Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, um, it's really ever more clear that we must work urgently towards holistic adaptation solutions uh, that also help us build a more sustainable and climate resilient uh, world. So um, why the Working Group? Well, nearly two years ago, um, I was working on a GIZ urban EBA project in central coastal Vietnam to identify potential urban EBA measures for the city. And during the desk review and preparatory work, um, as well as when preparing the final um, proposed measures, it really became clear that while there are many online portals with lots of information on EBA in general, um, this wasn't the same for urban EBA specifically. And, and much, much, um, much less so um, for the urban EBA in the global south, where there's quite a, quite a gap in information, or at least information um, online. So that said, there, there were at the time, and there still, still are today, um, some excellent online resources and examples from Europe and elsewhere on, on urban EBA, or nature-based solutions in cities. For example, there's the Naturevation Project, um, there's the European Climate Adaptation Platform, or Climate Adapt, um, there's also the Panorama platform, which have a wealth of information um, from the global north and, and some from the global south. There's also the UNEP Asia Pacific Urban EBA project, um, which is very interesting, but has very limited information on the actual measures themselves. And the ecosystem-based adaptation through South-South-North Cooperation Urban EBA library um, really has excellent potential as a resource, but, but currently lacks content. And even We Adapt, which is one of my favorite online platforms, um, didn't have too much when you get down to the nitty gritty of actually how to do um, urban EBA. And when I say how to do urban EBA, I mean, for example, you know, what are the specific urban EBA measures? Are they bioswales and sustainable uh, urban drainage system or SUDS? Is it urban wetland restoration or green walls and vertical gardens? And then what are the specific components or the pieces of any one of these measures? And how do they fit together? And also how do they fit into a broader uh, adaptation strategy? Then, of course, you have the social side, which is, you know, how participatory was the identification, design, and implementation processes? Um, were the marginalized voices actually heard? Or, or even better, were they prioritized in the de identification development of the measures? So with these questions, um, IUCN and Plan Adapt set out to embark on the FIBA Urban eBay Working Group journey. And we aim to bring together uh, researchers and practitioners from the fields of urban development, from EBA, nature-based solutions, green gray infrastructure, to really to identify and compile practical examples, um, to find the nuts and the bolts, or the nitty gritty, as I said, of, of urban EBA planning and implementation. But, but just wait a moment, because in this background, um, in the story, we've just arrived to 2020. 
and 2020 was the super year. It was the year for, for nature, the super year for nature. Uh, the post-2020 frameworks moving ahead, you know, biodiversity, the Paris Agreement pledges increasing in ambition. And what a year 2020 was. In the end, nearly nothing predicted happened uh, as anticipated um, due to, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. But if we try to take an optimistic view um, of the pandemic and of COVID, you know, hopefully we'll be able to pull out some lessons learned. Uh, although COVID has really wreaked havoc on communities, you know, from livelihoods and economies to health and education systems, it's also show, shown the high degree of our interdependencies. Um, but perhaps most markedly, it's, it's highlighted the inequalities among our, our capacities and the available resources to respond to a global threat such as a pandemic. And it has highlighted these inequalities at the national level, at local levels, and also at, at community and individual levels. So while the pandemic has, has really devastated communities across the globe, um, we really need to, to take this cruel experience uh, and turn it into a learning opportunity on, on multiple levels. So I hope now we're able to, to see just how we must work together collectively and collaboratively to confront other global threats. Also, I hope um, and, and I believe that it has highlighted the value and the importance uh, of our surroundings and of our environment, both built and, and natural. So across the planet, you know, month after month of lockdown and confinement, you know, led many to reflect on the importance of healthy living spaces and access to, to outdoors and to nature's. And I think also importantly here, particularly in, in urban October, um, really how cities must become more inhabitable for citizens to ensure their physical and mental health in times of crisis, as, as well as times of peace. So fortunately, while the super year never materialized in 2020, um, some of it has actually moved forward into 2021. And of course, I think the importance um, of nature and nature-based solutions has really emerged. Um, at least I'd like to think that it has emerged from the, from the pandemic. Okay, so um, with that minor digression um, and far from the minor impacts of COVID-19, I'd just like to come back uh, briefly here to the, the FIBA Urban Aid Working Group. So back up to speed today, um, over 18 months, uh, sorry, over 18 monthly working group meetings later uh, and a few breaks in between, an online survey in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, um, numerous hours and discussions uh, of the working group and of a analysis sub-working group we produced the joint FIBA technical paper titled Climate Justice for People and Nature Through Urban Ecosystem-Based Adaptation, a focus on the Global South. Um, so the paper highlights some of the results, as well as the EBA social principles, which you'll hear about more shortly from Mariana Vidal Marino. And really, the working group itself became an emergent process on bringing together social justice or climate justice and ecosystem-based adaptation in urban contexts. So today, um, we're really here to, to share this paper, but also to celebrate um, this achievement. Uh, and for me personally, um, the highlight has been the collaborative process, which really brought together a great group of professionals from diverse organizations who span the policy, practice, and research spectrum. And equally, perhaps even more importantly, were the personal relationships or the friendships um, that we have forged during this process. So overall, it's been a great experience. Um, where I also hope we've practiced the principles uh, that we preach and that you'll hear about soon. Uh, and so with that, I would just like to, to welcome you again to today's webinar, uh, to thank you for your participation today. Uh, and Annika, back to you, I believe. Yes, thank you, Jesse, for setting the stage so well. Before we continue on to the keynote speech, we have two more quick Mentimeter questions for you. Um, so please join via the link in the chat or go by going to menti.com and using the code on the screen if you haven't already done so. And it looks like a couple of people have already done so. Um, they've already started answering. Um, so the question is, did you join the World Cities Day webinar hosted by the Urban EVA Working Group, um, the same group, at this time last year? And it looks like a lot of people have not, um, but we have some repeat attendees. So thank you for joining us, whether this is your first time uh, tuning into the Urban EVA Working Group um, or if it um, is if you've been following along with us the whole time. Either way, welcome and thank you. And now we'll get to our last Mentimeter question for now. Um, we will have one more later on in the session, um, but our last Mentimeter question in this round is what do you hope to get out of this session? Um, so it's an open-ended um, answer. Uh, 
and we'd love to hear from you. So as those responses come in, Jesse, I'll hand it over to you for reflections on our participants' hopes for this session. Great, thank you very much again, Annika. And let's see what we hope uh, and what you hope to get out of this session, inspiration. That's, that's quite, a, quite a tough one to live up to, but we'll do what we can here. Um, a land use management in EBN cooperation with the locals. Excellent, I, I hope, hopefully you'll be able to hear some of that coming out in the case studies today. Being curious, which is excellent. Um, perspectives, which in our panel discussion, we hope to bring together some various perspectives um, on the EBA measures and just the EBA context in general. Practical examples, you'll hear a couple of those today uh, from the case studies, but also please do check out the publication where we have more practical examples in there. Um, knowledge, excellent. A contribution of NBS to adaptation to climate change. Yes, I think that's where we really tried to help to bring together the climate justice um, as well as the, the, NB, the NBS or EBA um, aspects. Another bit of knowledge there. Better understanding of the, the linkages between EBA and climate justice. Well, hopefully we'll hear about that throughout and that'll be a common thread throughout um, this webinar. Graspable options on how to improve climate justice through EBA. Again, we hope that's, that's really what we're working towards. Um, Again, we don't have all the answers, but this is exactly what we want to prompt others to start thinking about and, and even potentially you know, moving forward or working together. Good down-to-earth examples. Again, we'll have a couple of, of case studies that should hopefully give some of those down-to-earth examples and examples of e NBS application. Practical examples, excellent. Knowledge and work tools. Great, the knowledge, I think so. The work tools, I'm not sure. Um, so much, but also we'll, we'll hear what the panelists have to say in their presentations, but also in the discussion. Great. I think, um, yeah, that seems like an excellent, um, some excellent expectations, uh, also a, a high bar. So we'll see, um, we'll see what we can do uh, in terms of living up to that standard. Um, but thank you all for your interest and um, definitely please, you know, we have the Q&A. Um, so please do ask any questions you have in there, and we'll try to in bring them into the conversation today. Uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce our, our keynote speaker today, um, who's Harold Losak, is currently the head of project for mainstreaming EBA and strengthening ecosystem-based adaptation and planning and decision-making processes, which is uh, with the German Development Cooperation, or GIZ. And Harold has been working from 1995 to 2003 in Brazil, heading GIZ's contribution to the pilot program for the conservation of tropical forests, um, sorry, the tropical rainforests, which is PPG7. Uh, and from 2003 to 2017, Harold has been leading several programs in the field of sustainable development and natural resource management at GIZ headquarters. And from 2018 to 2021, he served as the coordinator of the GIZ program on biodiversity in Mexico. Uh, Harold holds a master's degree in sociology and political science from the Free University of Berlin. So Harold, it's my pleasure to turn over to you um, for today's keynote speech. So please, Harold, over to you. Thank you very much, Jesse. And um, thank you very much for your kind invitation and the opportunity to deliver the keynote speech for this important event on climate justice for people and nature through urban EBA. I hope you will be able to see my presentation. Um, well, it doesn't appear yet. Okay, so let us just start. My, uh, as uh, Jesse already said, my name is Harald Losak. I'm working currently at GIZ headquarters in our division of climate change, environment and infrastructure. And um, first of all, I have to admit that I'm not an expert in all dimensions of climate justice. This is a discussion um, which uh, of almost two decades now, 
But nevertheless, my intention here is to try to give you a short overview on the general linkages that I see between climate justice and our main topic, which is EBA. I will try to highlight why I think it matters and why we must overcome narrow sectoral approaches to meet the climate crisis we are facing. Next slide, please. Over the years, the international community has come to a more or less agreed definition on what is EBA. We consider EBA as, people -centered, as a people-centered concept, helping to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change by using actively the services of ecosystems and biodiversity within a broader adaptation strategy. Specific criteria have been um, developed to classify certain adaptation measures as EBA. According to these criteria, measures should uh, reduce social and environmental vulnerabilities and generate, uh, generate uh, societal benefits. At the same time, a contribution to restoration, maintenance and improvement of ecosystems is required. Furthermore, they should be based on policies on mul multiple levels and foster equitable, equitable governance structures through the implementation of capacity development measures. In this sense, EBA is an essential part of the umbrella term nature-based solutions, where EBA can be considered as nature-based solutions on adaptation. Next slide, please. Well, where, whereas EBA already has a solid conceptual basis, when it comes to the term of climate justice, we cannot say that there is a common definition or agreed uh, understanding of, the, of its concept. It's a very complex issue, and there is a long-standing discussion with multiple stakeholders involved, from indigenous organizations, grassroots institutions, to recent movements like Fridays for Future. Therefore, I would concentrate on some of the main elements relevant for our discussion. In general, climate justice intends to relate the effects of climate change to specific dimensions of justice, especially environmental and social justice. The main focus is on the ethical and political dimensions of the current climate crisis. We know that root causes of climate change and its impacts are distributed unequally, especially in the global south, where communities which have been historically uh, underprivileged are the most effective, putting in danger furthermore their livelihoods. To the historic, economic and social drivers of poverty and exclusion, we now would have to add the negative effects of climate change. Vulnerable communities most affected by climate change impacts also have the least resources available to combat it and thus have low resilience and ability to adapt. These communities are also less likely to be prioritized, prioritized in policies and planning as they have less capacity to advocate for themselves and may not be included in decision making. This is important to keep in mind so that the necessary support can, off, uh, can be offered through resources and implementation of participatory planning and development of long-term mitigation and adaptation strategies. Next slide, please. Let us have a closer look on some of the key elements of climate justice. On, hum on human rights, the guarantee of, a basic, uh, of basic rights rooted in respect for the dignity of the person, which is at the core of this approach, is an indispensable foundation for action on climate justice. The unequal distribution of resources between rich and poor, between north and south, 
and also within many countries, both in the north and in the south, um, is still uh, the deepest injustice of our age, making it impossible for millions and billions of humans to lead decent lives. Climate change highlights and exacerbates this gap in equality, but it also highlights our true interdependence and must lead to a new and respectful paradigm of sustainable development as a result of the combined efforts in mitigation and adaptation. The benefits and burdens associated with climate change and its resolution must be fairly allocated. The principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities in relation uh, to reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions is widely accepted. Those who have benefited and still benefit from the emissions have the ethical obligation to share benefits with those who are suffering from these effects um, and of, of, of these emissions. Mainly vulnerable people in low income countries should have access to opportunities to adapt to the impacts of climate change. The opportunity to participate in decision-making processes which are fair, accountable, open and corruption-free is essential to the growth of a culture of climate justice. Decisions on policies with regard to the climate change taken in a range of fora from the UNFCCC to trade, human rights, business, investment and development must be implemented in a way that is transparent and accountable. The gender dimension of climate change must be highlighted. The impacts of climate change are different for women and men, with women likely to bear the greater burden. Women are critically aware of the importance of climate justice and play a vital role as agents for change within their communities. The intergenerational dimension has been emphasized recently by the Fridays for Future movement. Climate justice has to guarantee equal and adequate conditions for future generations to establish decent livelihoods. Education and capacity development underpin the other elements, making their adoption more likely, hopefully. To achieve climate stabilization will necess necessitate radical changes in lifestyle and behavior. Environmental education is key to increase consciousness of climate change. Capacity development delivers concepts, skills and tools for successful adaptation to climate change. And last but not least, partnerships are key to solutions to climate change that are integrated both within states and across state boundaries. Climate justice requires effective action on a global scale, which in turn requires a pooling of resources and a sharing of skills across the world. Next slide, please. If we now compare the key elements of climate justice with the criteria established for qualifying EBA measures, we can detect, detect innumerable interlinkages. The arrows drawn in the slide are only a small part of a possible mapping, which is far from complete, and it only shows the vast field of coincidence. The climate justice community and the EBA community are converging with regard to similar challenges with similar dis descriptions and possible solutions. What I want to say is that we have to bring these communities together in order to break down existing silos and develop a more comprehensive and systemic view of problems and solutions. Besides looking at each of the key elements, we can also describe some cross-cutting dimensions of justice, which have to do with the distributive aspects of, for example, benefits, the fairness of processes, 
and the recognition of cer certain historical contexts of inequality. These dimensions refer to several contents and give important guidance for translating the principles into action. Next slide, please. In a general discussion, we can detect, uh, detect opportunities and also challenges of a joint approach. As we have already seen, among the opportunities are the efforts of cracking down silos, facilitating more comprehensive and systemic views and promoting cross-sectoral and interdisciplinary thinking. We would broaden the number of co-benefits, enriching social and economic advantages with legal aspects of guaranteeing human and social rights. EBA offers a wide range of co-benefits and for vulnerable uh, communities, especially compared, for example, to gray solutions, which may even disadvantage or displace them. At the same time, we must be aware of the major challenges implementing these new concepts on the ground. We would have to avoid just another layer of criteria, which could create excessive demand for stakeholders to cope with. Obviously, there has to be an adapting effort for each sector we deal with. There is no silver bullet. The main challenge uh, may be encountered in the way we manage clashes between different views from the global north and the global south, which have been developed along many years and can partly be considered as a result of silo discussions. Another challenge is the way countries and stakeholders are able to guarantee or not real participation in planning stakeholders. Uh, in, excuse me. Another challenge is the way the countries are able to guarantee uh, the participation in planning proces processes and the use of positive outcomes and benefits of EBA measures. Next slide, please. So coming to an end of this short intro, um, I'm very much looking forward to the next presentation on the development of social principles for EBA and the first results of a mapping in different urban contexts in the global south. Uh, but I still would like to mention at this point that we as a global project for mainstreaming EBA are very pleased to announce a new publication publication called Introduction to Sustainable Urban Design and Ecosystem-Based Solutions in Buildings that was written in cooperation with our partners, our Brazilian partners of Klug Architecture, uh, Architectura and Plan Adapt and will be available soon. Urban issues will be a major focus in our future work. Next slide. Just to say thank you very much for your attention and waiting for your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Harold. Um, there's a whole lot to, to digest there. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> very interesting. Um, uh, for questions and comments, um, please do, as, as Wendy has put in the chat before, please do um, enter any questions you may have um, in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, when we get to the panel discussion, we can, we can come back to those and hopefully have, have some responses uh, and thoughts on the questions that you may have, um, both from, from this opening keynote, as well as some of the other discussions and presentations that we have. Um, thank you very much, Harold. Uh, for me, interrelatedness and co-benefits are two words that really stuck out um, of that amongst all of it, because as I said, there's, there's a whole lot. Um, but thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, now it's my pleasure to move on to the next um, presentation today, which is actually the presentation um, on the paper that I had mentioned before. That is actually the joint technical paper from the FIBA Urban Bay Working Group. And for this presentation, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Mariana Vidal-Merino, 
and Mariana is a senior research analyst in PlanetApp's coordination hub. She's based in Dresden, Germany, and she works with PlanetApp to help shape the research work in view of climate change adaptation and climate risk management. And Mariana has 10 years of professional experience working on climate change adaptation, sustainable rural development, and natural resource management in the global south. And her exp expertise lies in the application of bottom-up mixed method approaches um, to identify and co-generate solutions to complex problems in the land use sector. So Mariana, it's a pleasure to have you here for this presentation. So why don't you help um, kick us off for the celebration you know, of this paper. Uh, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Jesse, for the uh, kind words of introduction. Uh, maybe you forgot to mention I'm also an active member of the Friends of Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Working Group on Urban Ecosystem-Based Adaptation. So um, next, please. It is overall a real honor, and I'm very excited about being the chosen one for presenting some of the results and highlights of the technical paper. Overall, our technical paper covers many related topics around the area, uh, the overall thematic of climate justice and urban ecosystem-based adaptation. So I will try to present some bits and pieces um, for you, but of course you are all welcome to really go and dive deep into the publication. And I also want to thank Harold for the extraordinary presentation, a lot of food for thoughts and especially fitting for uh, setting the stage for my presentation as well. And just before moving forward, once again, I, I know that Jesse already said it, but I really want to recognize the participatory spirit behind the whole process of making this uh, piece of work. And so my deepest admiration goes to all the co-authors, contributors, and people that in any way contributed to this publication, in, including the ones dealing with the design and formatting and editing and so on and so forth. Um, next, please. Thank you. And just some, um, some words about the background of this technical paper. I think a lot was already said, um, but basically, once again, just uh, to enhance what was already said, nature-based solutions uh, can proofly help us conserve, restore, rehabilitate, and sustainably manage ecosystems in cities. Uh, but what is the purpose of doing that? Well, because by conserving, restoring, and managing ecosystems, we can effectively help cities address systemic challenges such as food insecurity, biodiversity, and climate change adaptation. Urban ecosystem-based adaptation is the use of ecosystems and ecosystem services for helping people adapt to climate change and increase resilience in cities. Green and blue spaces can effectively help reduce climate change effects such as the urban heat island effect, droughts, flood risks, pollution, among many, many other risks. But besides this, ecosystem-based adaptation can also generate a variety of co-benefits, such, such as economic development through job creation and livelihood diversification. So all that makes ecosystem-based adaptation initiatives quite attractive investments when compared with traditional gray solutions. And that is all great using nature in the benefit of people while boosting biodiversity in cities. But actually, for whom are these benefits being generated and at which level? So we know, yes, we are speaking about cities, but cities are not formed by homogeneous groups of people. So how exactly are these benefits brought about and for whom? Next, please. Those were some of the questions that motivated the initial research and reflection process within our working group. And what we quickly realized was that there were like some particular challenges when trying to find information about that. And Jesse already touched upon some of them. Uh, could you just click uh, once more? I think, yeah, perfect. So the first challenge that we encountered was that we didn't find enough practical information or evidence base for implementing EBA in an urban context. And that was particularly, 
particularly true when speaking about cities in the global south. For instance, when we were looking at India, we found quite a bit of act, uh, adaptation action evidence focused on rural areas, but rather not so much in cities. And even though the knowledge and insights that we found from the global south were quite rich, we were also quite aware that we couldn't directly kind of transfer that knowledge to other uh, contexts and regions due to obvious differences in social and environmental and climatic conditions. So that was the first challenge that we encountered. And the second one relates with um, the issue that social and climate justice perspective were not always taken into account or at least were not really reported in the literature that we were finding. And that was of concern, uh, pretty much because if we don't consider issues of climate justice in the design and implementation of ecosystem-based adaptation in cities, we are facing the risk of uh, unintendedly reproducing or exacerbating existing inequalities. And such inequalities may include, for instance, uh, the unequal distribution of green and blue spaces in a given city, leading to the uneven distribution of the ecosystem services that these solutions provide. Another potential negative effect, for instance, is that by re-greening certain areas, for example, by establishing um, a new park, like the one that we are looking at, we are also aesthetically enhancing uh, some areas of the city, and that might lead to an increase in the price of the real estates around that area, so that some um, minorities or low income groups might be outpriced and, and need to relocate due to these increasing prices. Next slide, please. So within our working group, these were some of the issues that motivated the work that led to this technical paper. Our main ethical assumption during this whole process is that we need climate justice as a perspective to be included when implementing ecosystem-based adaptation initiatives in order to ensure that at the end, the, out, out, the process will be transparent, accountable, and that the outcomes will be culturally appropriate and equitable. Next slide, please. And Harold already mentioned that there are several definitions about climate justice. And in the context of our publication, we define climate justice or understood it as the fair treatment of all people when designing interventions that address the causes and effects of climate change. In other words, interventions should consider the disproportionate causes and effects on, of climate change on peoples based on their geographic location, gender, religion, and also including and taking into account future generations. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so to identify these elements of climate justice, what we did uh, within the working group was we look at the elements of EBA design and implementation that's, that spoke or were aligned to the concepts of climate justice. Um, could you click once more, please? Yeah, thank you. So first, uh, we did a mapping exercise to identify relevant social aspects of ecosystem-based adaptation by looking at existing conceptual papers on EBA principles and criteria. Um, click, please. Thank you. Secondly, or actually in parallel, we we started grouping these social principles and criteria according to how they were conceptualized in these different documents that we were reviewing. And then based on that, we derived definitions for each principle. Uh, next, we linked social principles and criteria of, uh, of EBA that we already identified with the valid principles of climate justice. And the intention behind doing that or that exercise was to allow us a deeper understanding of how climate justice and EBA interventions are interlinked. And last but not least, we wanted to look at practical examples of ecosystem-based uh, adaptation initiatives and how this incorporated social principles in their design and implementation. And furthermore, we wanted to see 
which social benefits and challenges were observed as outcomes from the implementation. And for this, we'll, we launched an online survey uh, to collect case studies, and we got 31 valid responses that provided preliminary, but yet quite insightful results. Uh, and overall, these steps were not by no means a linear process, but were more like an interactive one. So the definition of these principles were being adjusted at, and developing as, as we got different inputs from literature, but also from the incoming case studies. Uh, next, please. And the, as a result, we identified seven EBA social principles and defined them. And I will briefly uh, touch upon them. In the next section, the next present presenters will uh, more look at how these principles are implemented in practice. And yes, next, please. So the first principle is participation and inclusiveness. And this principle refers to using participatory methods and including local stakeholders, particularly marginalized groups in implementation and design of EBA interventions. And this inclusion and use of participatory tools is not because it's a nice idea to involve everyone, but because at the end of the day, we want our ecosystem-based adaptation interventions to be transparent, accountable, and culturally appropriate. And just briefly to mention that out of all the principles that we had, this was the principle that was behind the majority of case studies that we have received, which was uh, quite a positive uh, result. Next one, please. The second principle was or is capacity building, and that implies the active enhancing and strength and resource available to societies and communities. So this principle uh, was also very much linked in the discussion while developing it with the concept of empowering and how through capacity building, we could achieve empowering the different societies in which ecosystem-based adaptation was being implemented. Um, next, please. The third principle is fairness and equitability. And this principle promotes, promotes access to benefits by all, particularly by marginalized and vulnerable groups. And as I said before, it also is about not exacerbating existing inequalities or replicating existing inequalities. Um, Questions that relate to this uh, principle include, for instance, whether ecosystem-based adaptation initi initiatives promote equal access to benefits for citizens of different ages, gender, or vulnerable groups. Next slide, please. The fourth princip principle is gender consideration. And this one was a principle that was highly debated as well. The definition that we have for it is uh, that it's about ensuring that interventions do consider the differentiated roles and responsibilities of individuals based on their gender identity and sexual orientation. And here I must say that our initial definition was around equal access to benefits by men and women and also consideration of the disproportionate impact of climate change on women. Um, but later on, um, and that was a result of the reviewers, we received the, an input that allowed us to reformulate uh, this definition in order to include gender identity and sexual orientation as part of the definition of gender. And I think we are all quite happy with that input. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, the fifth principle is livelihood improvement. And that it relates with the fact that EBA should help to ensure income security, resource distribution, and working conditions, as well as to maintain or in, and not degradate human, social, natural, physical, or financial assets. Um, and I must say this principle of all the ones was the one that we observed the least among the case studies that we received. Uh, 
probably because it, it, it was underreported. It could also be that it's because the, the implementation was too fresh in order to really see whether in the long run there were a, a real improvement in the livelihoods of, of local people or due to other reasons, but um, yeah, it was really poorly represented as, as a positive effect of implementation of EBAs in cities. Um, next, please. We have next integration of indigenous and local knowledge. Initially was only defined as integration of indigenous knowledge and also due to inputs of the group and external reviewers, we added local knowledge as a way of acknowledging that, of course, indigenous and local knowledge is not the same and they are both important. And this principle aims to equitably consider all types of knowledges to ensure effective and locally appropriate adaptation. Next, please. And the last one is about appropriateness of scale, which means considering how the intervention fits in the overall spatial temporal landscape and also within the variety of stakeholders and policy dimensions. And this was also a highly debated principle and we defined it by further breaking it down into three sub-concepts, and these are the concepts of scaling up, scaling out, and scaling deep. Scaling up referring to how EPA initiatives may impact policies and regulations in the cities where they are implemented. Scaling out uh, as implying the expanding of implementation measures, and scaling deep, which refers to how um, EPA measures can actually impact the cultural roots relationships and communities within the societies where initiatives are implemented. Next, please. And yeah, that those were the seven EBA social principles in a nutshell. Uh, next, please. Just to mention uh, briefly that we made some deep dives into some of the case studies to really analyze how this seven principles were mirrored or being or were being represented or operationalized in these case studies. And you have that available via story maps that I'm sure that information will be shared also with you throughout um, this session. Next, please. So if you want to, to really go deep into that, those case studies, please go ahead and visit the story maps. Otherwise, today we will have also a couple of case studies that are quite interesting, so stick around. Um, next, please. Once again, uh, my deepest uh, acknowledgement to everybody that was part of the making uh, of this uh, technical paper. It was for me such a, a growing and learning experience, so I enjoyed it very much. And as Jesse mentioned, it was not only a journey of learning, uh, professionally, but also of uh, getting closer to so many other great human beings. So thank you, everyone. And with that, I finish my presentation. Over to you, Jesse, I guess. Yes, thank you very much, Mariana, for the, the bit of the background and overview. And then, of course, going into the principles there um, themselves. So excellent. Um, again, uh, for the listeners, the audience, please, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them into the, to the chat or the Q&A, uh, and we can come back to them in the panel, which is actually this next session. So I'd like to convene our panel discussion here. And in this panel discussion, imagine people moving on stage. Uh, we're going to look at on the ground implementation of the EBA social principles. Um, so we've had Harold, of course, set up uh, the, the overall context, Mariana share on the EBA social principles themselves. But before we really get into kind of the questions for the panel here, um, where we can again take some of the questions you may have in the audience, um, I'd like to first hear from the case studies um, themselves. So maybe we can start first um, with, uh, with Christian. And um, Christian Figueroa, is a young architect with nine years of experience in international cooperation for development field at um, Fundasal, which is a Salvadorian foundation for development and social housing. And he has a master's from South Korea in global urban policy 
which is a key instrument to achieve sustainable urban development across countries, regions, and cities. And so Christian will be presenting, of course, one of the case studies that Mariana was just kind of mentioning or alluding to had been a part of this work itself. Um, so Christian, please, over to you. Hey, thank you so much for a great introduction. Let's see if we have a presentation. Sorry about that, one moment. There we go, it's the number 35. We're ready. Okay, um, good morning uh, from El Salvador. My name is Christian Figueroa. I'm a project coordinator support at Fundasal. And since 2017, we are implemented, uh, we are part of the organizations implementing the City Adapt project. Um, I will tell you just a briefly description of City Adapt. Could we please go to the second slide? The next one, please, just to be brief. Um, City Adapt um, is a project funded by the Global Environment Facility, executed by the Regional Office of, for Latin American and the Caribbean of the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, the project trying to promote climate resilience in urban areas through the implementation of nature-based solutions for adaptation. Um, it takes place in three cities, Jalapa, Mexico, Kingston, Jamaica, and San Salvador, El Salvador. Our main goal is to strengthen the technical capacities of municipalities and citizens to analyze the impacts and vulnerabilities associated with climate change and identifying appropriate nature-based solutions in the territory and the context of San Salvador. Next one, please. In this chart, um, you can see the pilot interventions implemented by the project and their relationship with the impacts of climate change. Most of them are related to the management of water resources. Next one, please. For us, it's really important involving local stakeholders in decision-making through a participatory process. These processes have a sensitive approach that embrace transparency, empowerment, and accountability for the government addressing climate change urban resilience. It's basically a dynamic that involves collaboration, coordination and cooperation of the stakeholders on your responsibilities. And you can see all that we identify in our projects, mostly the government, the academy, private sectors, the technical sectors, et cetera. Next one, please. For this matter, we will explain the social principles in four stages for the project. First of all, the vulnerability assessment. Secondly, the selection of ecosystem-based adaptation measures and implementation locations, then the implementation itself, and finally, the monitoring and evaluation. Next one, please. For the vulnerability assessment, we included um, the local community's concerns, starting a process that, with an inclusive approach that gives us the opportunity to develop capacity and exchange of knowledge identifying the impacts of climate change on these communities and designing the interventions to reduce climate vulnerability for people at appropriate scale. Next one, please. For the selection of measures and implementation locations, we recognize the uneven impacts of climate change on women. So our interventions are designed to empower women on management and ownership of natural resources. For us, what's really important to create a methodology that identifies livelihoods according to the specific ecosystems in place. This methodology considers data, research collection, and supporting local cultural and biodiversity affected by climate change. Also, a socioeconomic model that safeguards the fundamental right to a healthy ecosystem, especially focused on the water national crisis. Our intervention support socioeconomic benefits that go beyond improving adaptive capacity. The strategies implemented in City Adapt are aligned with long-term development challenges, such as unsustainable use of natural resources like water. Next one, please. For the implementation matter, our, our biggest challenge is to contribute to addressing the structural 
emotional and governance inequities already existing. We believe in education about ecosystem-based adaptation. That's why we are having interventions along with the students and school, capacity building for municipalities, communities, and local stakeholders. City ADAPT promotes the right of young people as equal partners in the movement to address climate change impacts. The next one, please. And even though El Salvador is a small territory compared to other nations, we embrace diversity of culture, recognizing in social and biodiversity terms. Through the experimentation and monitoring, we identify the local native species of flora in each community at the landscape and micro watershed scale approach. The next one, please. Our goal is to get the support to the implementation of ecosystem-based adaptation by policies at multiple levels, by these actors taking into account the interaction that occur across different social and ecological scales. Well, gracias uh, um, for this. Um, this is the presentation, the brief description of the project, but we are ready for discussion and get into the details later. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, and yes, as, as you said, this is just to kind of put a bit of context to the conversation that we'll have. And we would just like to hear next um, from the next panelist, who is Jessica Troni, uh, who's the Chief Climate Change Adaptation Unit Adaptation Portfolio Manager. Um, and Jessica has more than 20 years of experience in environment and development policy and has worked on climate change adaptation programming for the UN for the last 11 years. And she served as UNDP Regional Technical Advisor for Adaptation for the East and Southeastern African region between 2007 and 2014, and for the UK Department for International Development Headquarters from 2003 to 2007 as the Adaptation Policy Lead uh, and as the UK Representative in the EU Delegation to the UNFCCC for four years, where she was responsible for negotiating the COPE decision for the Least Developed Countries Fund, among other agenda items. And Jessica will be presenting again um, on behalf of UNEP for one of the case studies, again, that, that Mariana had mentioned here. So please, um, Jessica, over to you again for, for the brief overview of the case study. Thank you, Jesse. Um, could I have control of the share screen? At the moment, it's disabled. Great, just a moment. I think Annika can make that work. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, let me make that bigger. Okay, let's see if that works. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be presenting a project, um, actually a couple of projects that were implemented together, um, funded by the Least of Our Countries Fund and the Adaptation Fund from 2012 to 2019 in Tanzania, in coastal locations in Tanzania. Uh, the budget in total was something like $8 million, um, implemented in Dar es Salaam and five, five coastal districts, Pangani, Bagamoya, Rufiji, Muji, and Mkwani. Um, the executing entity was the vice president's office. And the main approach was one of gray and green investments. Um, um, scientific and technical capacity building and public engagement and awareness raising, um, touching on quite a few SDGs. So that's just the map of Tanzania. It's not the greatest quality. I've cut and paste that image, but you can basically see where it was located. Jessica, so, sorry to interrupt, Jessica. It doesn't seem like um, the, what we're seeing is the same as you. We can see your PowerPoint, but it hasn't moved and it's not in presentation mode. Maybe if oh. you. Go okay. out and come back in. Can you, can you see that now? I can see the overall presentation and the first slide, but not on presentation mode. Okay, sorry. Um, this has happened to me before and I'm not sure how to fix it. Not a problem. We do have the presentation and I could be able to share. And so okay. just be um, alerting how to skip ahead. Okay, yeah, I don't know why, sorry, I'm not 
a, techni a technical geek. <laughs> all the time. I just I just press buttons. That's all. <laughs> Excellent. Well, here you are now. Now we can see the map. So perfect. Back back to you. So then, next slide. Am I toggling between slides? Okay. So fairness and equitability was inherent in these projects because the projects were designed to address national adaptation program of action priorities. Here are just a few quotes from stories collected from the field. Sorry, I think we've lost. Have we lost the presentation? We're back on, I think, yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing what you're seeing now and what I'm seeing is something, okay, there we go. Um, right, so here's a few quotes from stories in the field. Um, the first one is around the seawall and I'm saying seawall, it wasn't an eco, it wasn't a green measure, but it, it was a necessary adaptation measure for, for Dar es Salaam because what the residents of that particular area of the city were experiencing was flooding and health effects. And the first quote is from one of the interviewees for the human interest story that we developed. The seaways were very violent, the water could not be managed. It was the lower class people who were really affected their future was damaged and opportunities were lost. I'll come back to that story. The second quote is from a coastal district. Um, and again, an interviewee that described how crop harvests had suffered from the seawater, bananas and cassava failed, and we had real problems with meals, sometimes only eating once or twice a day. And the third quote comes from some school children in, co in one of the coastal districts, Bagamoyo, who quoted that they were sometimes not drinking water from morning until evening because of the salinization of wells. So these were very real problems we were dealing with. Next slide, please. So this was one of the stories that we published in, uh, in July, 2018. Um, you've got the web link there and there's also a video that was made. Um, essentially, it was about, um, it was about uh, protecting Dar es Salaam from flood risk. World Bank estimates that climate change will hit East Africa hard, forcing more than 10 million people to flee their homes by 2050. Coastal metropolis of Dar es Salaam is at risk. Five million residents, many of them poor, are living in low-lying cities surrounded by ever-rising uh, seas. And the story tells of sea levels rising, the coastline being eroded, trees that once flanked the coastal road dying from salt poisoning, and businesses that survived along that coastal road um, being uh, lost, um, and obviously people losing out. Um, but it's not just that, it's also intense rainfall in Dar es Salaam, which is flooding entire neighborhoods. Uh, water accumulates in this flat city, eroding the foundations of buildings, and even when residents expend all efforts to keep their homes dry, sometimes even permanently cementing with the bottom half of their front doors, the stagnant water erodes the outer walls and causes them to flake away. Not only that, obviously toilets flood and then people get the infectious diseases, cholera, diarrhea, typhoid. And so the project built 2.4 kilometer seawall for this area of Dar es Salaam and a network of drainage systems was carved out to channel floodwaters to the ocean. Uh, before the project was finished, there was already reported uh, significant benefits for the residents in that part of the city and economic activity was reported to have been recovered. In combination with that seawall, the project restored areas of mangroves, which also act as natural barriers against wave surges. But, you know, to note that, you know, it takes time for nature to come back and, and provide its protective function. And sometimes when the impacts are too big and the needs are too urgent, you do have to resort to some gray infrastructure. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a story uh, coming out from Bagamoyo. This was published uh, in March, 2019. Uh, again, you've got the web link there to the story. And this is around um, saltwater intrusion uh, into water and soils. 
uh, the villages in Bagamoya formed a non-governmental uh, non organization to fight the effects of climate change and, and, uh, and restore mangroves. Um, they reported the concentration of salt had been reduced, uh, water to be okay after about three years of planting. This community group also carries out patrols during the morning and the afternoon low tides, persuading people to stop activities like charcoal making. And now that the fish have come back, of course, there is a viable livelihood to replace charcoal making. Um, and the local people reported fish coming back and more crabs being able to be caught and so on. The third story is around quite a poignant story about um, children in Zanzibar having to drink salty water um, because of saline intrusion and no alternatives. Um, it's quite distressing actually when you read the story because essentially there was a whole raft of health problems uh, drinking saline water. People could not afford anything else. Whenever they built another well, it was equally a saline. Um, and uh, they started paying for water to be trucked in, but this quickly became unaffordable um, as did students spending on bottled water. So there was a lot of absenteeism. Students would spend time looking for water they would be sick a lot of the time. And what this project did was construct a rainwater harvesting system involving rooftop guttering and a series of large tanks of storing water, um, an estimated 147,000 litres of water. So those are three stories coming out of this project. Next slide, please. And now just to talk about the other principles. Sure. Sorry, we're a little bit over time, but we will have a Q and A set, uh, in the segment to have to discuss the linkages between the projects and the principles. So, if it's okay, if I can have you pause here for a moment and while we reflect on the three case studies and move on, and then we'll come back to this. Uh, well, okay, but I would just like to make a few points to end then. All right, perfect. <laughs> okay, okay. So I won't run through this. This was what the project achieved in terms of livelihoods improvement. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of, I've lumped, okay. In terms of uh, gender equity, the project could have done better. Um, in truth, the right people were not sitting around the table and we didn't have the right expertise in the team. And I will come back to that issue in a minute. Next slide, please. Thank you. Appropriateness of scale, integration of local knowledge. Um, this was a project that was that had a very strong country-driven approach. The ministry had um, a very clear idea about how they wanted to execute this project, and that was a good thing. It was very locally um, engaged. District officers, environmental officers in, um, in the ministries um, were the lead at the district level. Um, it had a very strong uh, focus on community-based organizations. 54 were registered, many participated um, in the activities and a, a, a local CBO network was also um, supported um, and NGOs were also contracted. So it had a very locally based implementation model driven by government. Next slide, please. Okay, and then in terms of capacity development, the time of evaluation did show that, um, you know, there was a high um, likelihood that this would be institutionally sustainable. Next slide, please. Lessons learned, and this is what I really wanted to come back to. Um, the financial sustainability is a huge issue, even though there were lots of good lessons learned at a technical level, at a government coordination level, um, at a CBO and NGO collaboration level, the financial sustainability is not there. And so it, it would be interesting to do um, an impact, sorry, uh, it would be interesting to, to do an impact assessment to see how many of those practices were continued. Um, and so, for future, what we really need to do is to look at private, blended private sector models to continue these practices and, and support the upscaling. 
The second is that the baseline issues um, do threaten adaptation gains. So things like untreated sewage and industrial effluent threaten mangroves, illegal logging and charcoal production is also an issue. So in terms of appropriateness of scale, um, you need to look at various levels. It's not just the climate change stress, it's also the baseline development trajectories that need to be um, tackled. And the third, and this is a really interesting one, is the use of technical services would have enhanced quality, effectiveness and efficiency. This point was in three lessons learned in, um, in the terminal evaluation. Um, and that actually, in the country reality means it needs to be balanced with the issue that, you know, governments want to own and drive the projects. And often these projects are internally executed by the ministry 100%. And so there's issues there in terms of who sits around the table, who's part of the team, because invariably what that will mean is different people get consulted or they don't get consulted. Um, and also in terms of effectiveness, that sort of approach where it is 100% internally driven by the government can be slow, it can be imperfect, and certain of the climate justice principles may not be achieved. However, if you take the, the longer term look, it is a development trajectory and with every project we improve the approach and there are lessons learned for the government to take up as well. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, and yeah, sorry for having to cut you short on some of the some of the actual case study itself. Um, in fact, you've, you've even answered, preempted some of the questions that we have for the, for the panel here. Um, but we'll get into the panel. And to, to kick that off, I just want to introduce um, the person on the panel who has not been introduced yet, who's Wende Atieno, who is an ecosystem-based adaptation program officer um, with IUCN's ecosystem management program in Washington, DC. And Wendy supports uh, IUCN's nature-based solutions for climate adaptation activities in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, facilitating the reciprocal relationship between global policy and action on the ground. And she has a field, uh, sorry, she has field and research experience um, on transboundary water governance, climate change adaptation, and urban informality. So welcome, Wendy, uh, and also, of course, welcome everyone else, which means Christian, Jessica, Harold, Mariana, and Wendy. I'd like to start, um, well, first to let, let the audience know that we'll be using the, the remainder of our time for the panel discussion itself. Um, and I realized that we'd hope to have a bit more time, but as you can see, each of these case studies was, was really just so rich. We could probably have a, a webinar on, on each of them themselves. Um, but I wanted to start the panel discussion with with a question to, to Wendy. Um, so Wendy, today there's quite a bit of technical guidance on EBA standards and implementation that's available. We've, we've even already heard of the EBA qualification criteria and quality standards, the global standard on nature-based solutions. So how do you see the EBA social principles fitting within these existing uh, guidance? Thank you, Jesse, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, it's really wonderful to hear from everybody and it's always we've had this is the second time we're having this event and it's always um, very inspiring to hear how this work is being carried out in the field um so harold had already presented very extensively on the links between the eba and the social justice criteria but just to highlight one piece is that eba and EBA implementation requires a balance of um, social, ecologic, and economic aspects. And when we're talking about social and talking about people, then you have the questions of justice and how that arises. How are the benefits shared? Who is being involved as part of the discussion process? Who's being invited to the table? To go back to what Jessica was presenting. And those are questions then that are addressed by climate justice. And um, looking at the EPA social principles, these are also what we're trying to get into a bit more deeply. Um, I would also want to just talk more about the NBS standard, the Global Standard of Nature-Based Solutions, which IUCN launched in July of 2020. The NBS standard has um, eight criteria and 28 indicators. And as we know, um, ecosystem-based adaptation is the, is the operationalization of nature-based solutions specific to climate adaptation. So when we're talking about the standard, it also applies to the EBA, um, to EBA, which also links with the EBA criteria and the social principles. 
And I want to just highlight five of the eight criteria for the NBS standard. The first is that NBS address societal challenges. And what we're identifying here as we're talking about climate um, is, is the challenge of climate change and um, climate adaptation. And so thinking about the differentiated risks, um, impacts and vulnerabilities, and as well as the distribution of the benefits of this implementation. Um, the second criteria is that NBS are designed, uh, the design of NBS is informed by scale. And specific to this is you're considering the interactions across different social and ecologic scales within a landscape or a seascape. Um, the fifth one is a question of inclusive governance. Um, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? Who is getting a seat at the table? Who is getting an opportunity to design these processes and not just only in implementation? Um, and um, the fourth and sixth criteria on economic viability and balancing trade-offs, we're thinking about not just the benefits, but also the costs and the costs at the design stage as well as the implementation stage. Who gets to bear these costs? and how are the benefits distributed. And finally, when we're talking about sustainability and mainstreaming, which is the eighth criteria, um, looking at how this information is circulated, it needs to be disseminated freely and openly because this then allows for lesson sharing and allows to determine whether the envious processes that have been implemented are appropriate and we keep having that feedback loop. So to tie this back to the social principles, then you're seeing quest, um, links with fairness and equitability you're seeing links with the social principle and appropriateness of scale, which as Mariana mentioned, is not just you know, scaling up, you're scaling up and down laterally, you're scaling wide, you're also scaling deep. Um, questions on participation and inclus inclusiveness and gender consideration. Um, and then again, fairness and equitability keeps coming up, I think for all of these criteria. And then on the eighth one on sustainability and mainstreaming is where you see capacity building coming in, because if you are going to be sharing lessons, then you need to have people's capacity strengthened in order to identify um, if these NBS strategies are working, how well they're working, where the gaps are, and how these can be addressed. Um, and overall, for all of these, again, because we're talking about participation, then the integration of Indigenous and local knowledge. Thank you, Jesse. Excellent. Thank you very much for that um, kind of overview here and also linking up to, again, the, the NBS, um, you know, the, the global standards and the criteria there. So thank you for that, Wendy. Um, what I want to do now is, is kind of move on with a second, actually, first, first to tell you that I, I did have a second question um, that was really particularly for the, for the two case studies we've seen, which was asking if you see these, these EBA social principles reflected in your work. Um, but I think that you've both quite clearly touched on those. Um, in fact, uh, you know, Christian, you had that, that nice um, kind of overview, you know, of actually linking the principles to the work. And Jessica, you touched, I think, on them quite a bit in, in the findings, you know, and actually what you've kind of the lessons learned there. So I'd like to actually change the question a bit and, and look here kind of about in hindsight, Right. In hindsight, is there something that could have strengthened the integration of the key elements of climate justice and EBA criteria in these in these projects that you've worked on? Um, obviously, everything is as much you know more clear. You know, say 20, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, but maybe we we start with Christian. Is there something that you know looking back? There's something that may have strengthened um, the actual the integration of these of climate justice and EBA criteria projects. Oh, oh thank you so much. <clears throat> Well, I believe from the uh, city adapt to Salvador experience, the gender considerations were very clear and crucial for the execution, especially because um, we have a poverty um, statistic that is really high. And the face of that poverty is women, right? So they are the most vulnerable. So our interventions were really oriented and created for women, single mothers, uh, girls, and, and and most of the cooperatives or organization communities that are already uh, in place in these areas of intervention are mostly focused on women. They, they are the ones who are willing to work with organizations who are very receptive to any kind of topics like this because they feel really affected by that. So uh, I think gender considerations were really crucial. And also the integration of local knowledge, like these people, the communities that we work with, they've been there for years, generations and generations, right? So they have a lot of knowledge about how their environment change. And even though we have a statistics and 
data collection or research, we need to validate that information with the communities. So those, that was really crucial for us to have the integration of local knowledge and also the gender considerations from the communities. Very briefly like that. We can go into details more, but uh, those were the most crucial that we think in El Salvador were very, very um, a, a glue for the whole interventions and the whole project. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christian. And Jessica, same same question to you, kind of in hindsight, again, you know, was there something that maybe could have, you could have strengthened the linkages? Uh, I'm sorry, more. yeah, sure. Having um, um, uh, the, the right project team in place, and we're getting smarter about doing that, but um, certainly involving women um, more effectively in the decision making in the project um, would have helped. And I think there are differences here between some of the countries in Africa and Latin America. I think Latin America is is much easier to get this kind of approach um, into projects. In some countries in Africa, it's not as easy, but you know, we improve from project to project. The other thing is, is, is the quality of capacity building, um, the quality of the training that's put together, um, the quality of the capacity development. That's really important. And that's, you often need the right technical inputs um, and that's a question of two things. One is just project management skills, which are again, you know, not perfect, but you know, we improve over time. Um, but it's also in terms of capacities in the country, quite often we don't, and again, I think this is the difference between Latin America and, and uh, maybe the LDC group, is that we don't often have those capacities in the local market. And so twinning between national consultants and international consultants becomes critical um, to get you know, proper monitoring evaluation, to get proper training products and content developed and so on. So I'm not sure if any of what I'm saying is, is particularly um, uh, you know, surprising, but it does need to be said. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that, Jessica. Um, and, and I will also say um, that we will run over a little bit here in time. So those of you who do have extra time to stay, um, please do. Uh, and if you're unable to, we'll understand, of course, because um, uh, we'll just, we are a bit going to go over a bit, but I think it's important that we hear um, you know, from, from all the panelists here and, and these different perspectives. Since, since we brought this, this rich knowledge and this you know, group together, let's, let's take advantage of it. Um, great, so I, actually I'd like to kind of move and. It's actually an interesting segue because Christian, you really talked about, you know, on the ground, the engagements, Jessica, you kind of moved up a level um, kind of to that project management. And I want to move to you, Harold, um, and to the, the global level, um, which is in the upcoming um, COP26, you know, do you think something like the EBA social principles, so climate justice through EBA, um, will even be discussed or taken into consideration? And you know, you could even question: Should it perhaps even have a more prominent role in the negotiations themselves? But Harold, what are your what are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you very much for this very important question. <laughs> I think uh, the we hope so. Yes, uh, and we have some good news that. Uh, we have an unprecedented interest in nature right? um, and the in, in the climate uh, uh, community and um, nature based solutions, for example, is one of the priorities of the uh, um, UK COP presidency. No? So EBA as part of nature based solutions no, is uh, also one of the priorities. And what we have to see is that maybe um, there is a lack of understanding yet between um, um, certain other communities because um, we face in the biodiversity neg negotiations, for example, a, a very critical discussion né, on nature-based solutions. Né? So what I think uh, is very necessary and maybe uh, the the um, UNFCCC COP can uh, bridge this a little bit 
um, is a common understanding on, on, uh, of nature-based solutions as, as uh, an agreed uh, term for um, international uh, uh, discussions and, and negotiations because um, this would help uh, uh, the concept and, and would help us as well on the ground, right? designing cooperation programs and, and projects. And another aspect is um, that uh, this is very important because um, uh, there are two movements. Now we have the NDCs more or less updated now, uh, for the COP, uh, but um, we uh, con with the postponement of, of the uh, negotiations in the um, uh, CBD, um, we still face... Um, uh, a process to update the national action plans or NBSUPs, no? and this will start soon after uh, the, uh, the CBD. And so we have a big um, uh, demand and, and a big challenge no, to put it all together. No? But coming back to the original question, I think uh, there will be a very, very um, heavy uh, and, and a substantial concentration on nature-based solutions um, and EBA as part of nature-based solutions will be one of the topics uh, which will be discussed in, in detail. Excellent, thanks. Thanks, Harold. Um, and yes, I mean, I think you also highlighted again, and I alluded to it at the start here in the super year where we have, you know, COP15, COP26, nature is coming to the fore. Um, so the, the timing in some ways is, is, is quite good um, where you have these aspects merging. Um, I wanted to go back actually to a point that, that, that you mentioned before, Harold, about the, the interrelatedness of these. And you mentioned human rights, uh, you know, equitable approaches, intergenerational, gender, um, et cetera. And uh, I know that, Mariana, you mentioned one of the points that was really discussed was who benefits, you know, from these investments? Um, and I think that's a really critical question. And in Wendy's presentation on the criteria, she mentioned fairness and equity, you know, being equitable as, as really critical aspects. Harold did as well. Um, I mean, do you, uh, just curious from the conversations that went on in the working group and developing the principles in the paper, I mean, how, how within the climate justice and the CBA principles, achieving climate justice through EBA, how prominent would you say that, you know, the fairness and equity, equity, equitable equity aspects actually came through in this? Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Jesse, for the question. Um, sorry, I have some noise in the background. Um, yeah, now, now it's gone. Great, thank you. Um, well, your question is about equity and um fairness and that's like one of the principles that that we define and it particularly speaks to with respect to marginalized or, or vulnerable groups and women and how to really not exacerbate existing inequalities and that is something that I actually i think kind of really nicely fit into the common agreement within the working group so it, it was not something that was actually debated um, it was like a of common um, agreement and but about that is just maybe to add about it there were also talks about these concepts that we nowadays hear about uh, leaving no one behind and building back better in in the framework of recovery from COVID-19 and when we are talking about that uh, locally then the the element of really who is this that we might leave behind that is at risk of being left behind it is much more present than when like ha what harold was saying in the international negotiations um, these concepts become just about developing countries and it's kind of sort of a, a, a mass of people and then implementation locally really need to look at these principles and the nitty gritty of actually who are the vulnerable ones. Um, as Jessica was also mentioning, there are 
huge difference when comparing with uh, African countries, for example, and Latin America, in terms of how these principles might actually vary. Uh, capacity building and governance structures within the countries are uh, quite different, like if you compare that. So actually, I think overall, this principle, but overall, all the principles are not just kind of tick boxes to say like we need to fulfill all of them, but actually to really contextualize how these principles look in specific case studies and based on that really try to, to honor them as, as much as possible, given the context that, as uh, was said, can be challenging. Great, thank you, Mariana. Well, due to time, I'm only going to do one more question, um, but this question is actually for everyone. And when I say everyone, it means everyone on the panel, I'd like you to respond in a minute or less. So this is like a hard talk challenge here, but also I mean everyone, um, because we have the same question for Mentimeter, which you've just seen in the chat there. And we'd really like to find out um, the same response from everybody. So first we'll start with the panel, but those, who are also just listening in and uh, attending, please do feel free to go to the mentee and, and respond as we hear from our panelists. But as you can see, the, the question is, looking to the future, you know, in your position or in your work, um, you know, what are the steps, the key steps to working toward climate justice through EBA? Again, looking a bit to the future, you individually in your own capacity, because again, we've heard, I think about, you know, interrelatedness, we've heard about different contexts from on the ground to global, so the COPE down to communities on the ground. So everybody can contribute to this. Everybody, you could even argue, must contribute to this. Um, but we're each in a different position, um, you know, uniquely placed to actually contribute to this. Uh, in fact, there's a really interesting book. This is kind of an aside, but um, called quantum social change and it you know says you are more than you're worth or more than you think you're worth in terms of social change and how it can come about um that book's by karen o'brien in case you're interested but um so with that i'd like to go to um i'd like to go to the panel and i will start here first um with christian again so please 30 seconds to one minute on again you and your position what would you see as the key steps towards working towards climate justice through eba Okay, uh, I believe that, we strongly believe that uh, having a really good map of actors is really important, right? We have to understand that this is a matter of problem that requires a multidisciplinary collaboration. So identifying uh, uh, the actors that conflict in the, in the territory is really important. So um, we have to acknowledge that we are not capable to do everything and we need the support from the community and from those the experts. And other thing is to create a methodology that really um, have a human rights approach, right? We know that creating community is not easy. It takes time to organize the community. And we need to have a, a methodology that really uh, recognize the appropriate scale to intervention and learning by doing long-term results, right? And finally, I would say that it's really important to have the international network support. Like this kind of exchange is help us to understand how we can be different, but at the same time embracing the diversity of solutions about um, ecosystem-based adaptations. So, um, and also I guess that the, the particular matter of um, these interventions of the experience of ecosystem-based solutions are always related to something else. And we need to try to promote these good practices at the escalating, right? Not just for the community, but to the national, to the regional level, also to the global. So um, the scale, the actors, the methodology are crucial parts for, for the future. Great, thank you very much, Christian. Jessica, same question, 30 seconds. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think the project vehicle is going to be um, fit for purpose in terms of transferring the amounts of monies that are needed, but neither do I think that absorptive capacity in developing countries is big enough to absorb what needs to be absorbed to fully adapt. So um, we need to work on systems. We need to 
I think we need to move towards budget support type systems, but that really points to having much stronger governance systems than we have. So um, we need to focus on planning, budgeting, um, and making sure that different voices are strengthened in that in that process and, and, and move away from the project mechanism. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. And Harold, over to you then. Same question. Oh, you're, you're currently muted, Harold. Yeah, thank you. Lost 10 seconds. Um, no, from a global perspective, I think it's very important to uh, just um, um, focus on the uh, synergies between um, the, the climate community and the biodiversity community. And EBA has the potential to bridge this né? because we are uh, active in, in, in both uh, communities. And on the other hand, I think uh, that we have to uh, keep on working uh, in a twofold way, uh, just supporting um, communities on the ground uh, now we have a very uh, a strong wish for the future to um, to invest more in uh, uh, all the uh, specific items and tools we have to, to to get it to the to the communities. And on the other hand, I think uh, we made the experience that um, uh, due to the pandemic, we just broadened our audience by our. Um, um, digital tools. No? We had uh, international uh, um, uh, uh, networking um, uh, 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 fora uh, when we came together in person, which is very important. We gathered 80 to 120 persons. No? So, and now we have 500 or more uh, that can uh, share our. Um, uh, fora and therefore we will be investing in e-learning tools just to to broaden the audience and uh, to have maybe this hybrid uh, um, approach uh, to do it on the ground and uh, digitally. Great, thank you very much, Harold. And then over to Mariana, same question. And thank you to the audience. I see a bunch, uh, lots of answers coming in here. It's excellent to hear from you as well, Mariana. Yes, thank you, Jesse. Um, so again, Cole, coming back to the COP negotiations, I think one of the things that we will see is that there will be a push towards the urgency of climate change adaptation. And that urgency will translate into accelerating adaptation action, hopefully. And here, ecosystem-based adaptation has a great potential to contribute to effective adaptation. but. Uh, for adaptation measures actually to work, technical considerations are very important, but as important that, as those technical considerations, we also need social and technical uh, guidelines for implementation. And that's where these uh, social principles presented in this webinar have uh, a lot of value to add. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Mariana. And then I will come um, to Wendy. And Wendy, as I will also be handing over um, for you to close, I would just like to come to you with any thoughts on this question as well, and then to go ahead and help close this webinar. So thank you all very much. And Wendy, over to you. Thank you all. Um, I think what I would have to do is basically every, 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 what everybody has said before me is perfect and really just to tie everything together. Um, Harold had mentioned, you know, EV has a potential to link climate change and biodiversity, but I think it even goes beyond that to include sustainable development as well. Um, and so thinking about having a stronger integrated approach, um, which goes back to what Jessica was talking about, the systemic approaches is really what we need. Thinking more broadly, more cross-sectoral and more systematically in order to be able to actually have solutions that last um, is really is really what we need. And when we're talking about climate justice, right, we work a lot in the environmental sector, but thinking about what are the other sectors that we can add in that do have a social development purpose that it is in their mandate then to look at how um, just approaches for humans. Right. Um, and so in closing, it's always unfortunate we never have enough time 
for these webinars and the conversations are always really exciting. I want to thank everybody um, who participated today. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Harold, to Christian, and to Jessica. Um, thank you to Mariana and Jesse, my fellow co-chairs for the Urban EBA Working Group. Um, Mariana said that she had been part of it, but Mariana led the publication of the, the led the technical publication, and so we're very grateful to her for that. I um, also want to thank my colleague Annika, who's working behind the scenes and has been helping us with the screen sharing. Um, thank you to the participants who took their time um, and for your attention, as well as for the engaging questions and the discussions. Um, the working group so far has finished its objective, which was twofold, to gather um, some of these nuts and bolts of EBA, of urban EBA specifically, and we've been able to achieve that, as well as also produce this social principles as part of the technical publication, um, which we have discussed today. We'll be taking a very well-earned break. Um, we'll be taking a very well-earned break and taking some time to consider the next steps for the working group. Um, and so if you have any ideas and want to stay up to date um, with the work of the Urban EBA Working Group, you may reach out to myself um, and to Jesse De Maria Kenny. Um, for the webinar, you will have received my email um, when you're registered for Zoom. So please do feel free to reach out. I wanna say thank you again to everyone and wish you all a wonderful rest of your day wherever you may be. Thank you.